So we're going to go to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 18. Now, Thyatira was a very small church in the smallest of these seven cities that are mentioned here to the seven churches in Revelation that were written by our Lord, not by John, but written by our Lord in a sense dictated to John on his behalf for the things that he needed the churches to hear. Thyatira was famous for the manufacturing of purple dye, if you didn't know that. It's mentioned in historical documents regarding the many trade guilds which manufactured cloth there. But nothing historically is found regarding Christianity there. It's interesting, except for what we read here in the Bible. But the Lord considered them enough to mention them in the Bible, and out of all the other seven churches, the letter was the longest letter written to the seven churches. Probably because he had a lot to say. The Hatira is only mentioned one other time in the Bible, and that would be in Acts chapter 16. There was a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, meaning talking to Paul and Silas, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And if you want to read about that whole adventure, it's in Acts chapter 16. And you'll see what happened to Paul and Silas when they were there, how they were imprisoned and God did some miraculous things there. But at the end of that visit there, he, him and Silas had to leave. And it ends by saying the work began by Paul and Silas, plus, you know, she, she, he actually uh, encouraged them, uh, the brethren that are there. So there was a brethren there already, in, in a sense, and then Paul and Silas went there and either assisted them in starting this work or encouraged them. But it's very possible that the church that we see here today was influenced by Lydia and the believers that were there already. So let's see what the Lord has to say about this church. Verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, whose eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, Love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall dash to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So as every letter addressed to every church, Jesus begins with a description of himself. And most of the time, that description has to do with the vision in chapter 1 that was revealed to John. There's a lot of symbolism in the description of Jesus because it tells us of the nature of Jesus in the description and what it is that he's describing himself as. It usually has to do with something going on at the church. In this case, Jesus addresses the church with the title, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Now, if you recall in chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, John wrote the things he saw, the vision of Jesus, just like here, 
And the flames and the brass had to do with Christ pictured as the righteous judge. With eyes that penetrate and no evil is hidden from him. He sees all things, even the hidden things. Nothing is hidden from his sight and his feet were like polished brass. And that brass is kind of like feet that have gone through the fire. In a sense, he did when he came in the form of a man and, you know, he was put to the test and he was successful. You know, he was without sin. And that's why he qualified to be the one who was worthy to, to take upon himself the sins of mankind. But polished brass is also strong and unmovable, which shows the character of Jesus Christ. And because of him, we too can be strong and unmovable. He is the one who was victory over his enemies. And in holy, jump, in, in holy judgment, like it says in the Bible, he tramples his enemies. Like in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, reminds us that he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation, that he came first to establish the kingdom of heaven, and then he will return to establish the kingdom here on earth. Now, when Jesus appeared to John, he used the title Son of Man, which we talked about has to speak of his humanity when he took on the form of flesh, but he was still fully God and fully man. But here he uses a different title, the Son of God. Now, in the Hebrew language, to say that you're the son of something means that you're of the same nature. For example, Peter bar Jonah meant that Peter was the son of his father Jonah. So he was in the same nature as his father. So what Jesus is stating here is that he had the divine nature as the father. And perhaps maybe this church forgot because sometimes our picture of Jesus is a little different than what the Bible describes him. We certainly see that true today in some of the churches, right? We want to see the love of Jesus, but we don't want to see the, the judgment or the wrath of Jesus. You know, we, we, we allow love to be the excuse for us to continue in sin because God understands or because God is compassionate and merciful, which is all true. But is that really what Jesus is about? You know, I was thinking about this this week, and I thought about how when Jesus went into the temple, into the courtyard of the Gentiles, and he overturned the tables. And I think sometimes if the Lord were to come today in our church, would he overturn the tables in our church? Would he overturn the tables in our lives? Because, you know, he is not allowing anything that the Father has done to, to, to become what it's not meant to be. When... God had instructed them to build a temple. He said, have a court for the Gentiles, for those who were not Hebrew, who could come, and it was a courtyard for them to pray. They weren't allowed into the inner courts, but they were allowed into that court so that they can pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was an outreach for the world because God is not inclusive just to the Jews. His desire was for all to come to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a matter of fact, that is why he placed them there. That's why he set aside that nation. It's called the holy nation because they were to be separated unto the Lord. They were to be the evangelists, the missionaries. They were the ones that were to point to the Messiah. They were the ones that were put right in the middle of all these civilizations that worshiped up multiple gods to show that there is only one true God. Christians sometimes think that the overturning of tables was really only meant for the religious Pharisees. But if we're not really walking right with God, if we're not really walking in obedience to the faith, then we're really religious too. Maybe we're not like the Pharisees where we try to keep the law, but we've replaced relationship with just doing things, reading, praying, going to church, but meanwhile, there's something lacking in our walk, and that lack is really just submission to the Lord and walking in obedience. But if we sin and do not repent, in a sense, we're guilty of being hypocrites, just like the Pharisees. And that word hypocrite sounds like a strong word, but it's really the Greek word for actors. So we're pretending to be something that we're not. We can say and talk Christianese, but if we're not doing it, then that's all it is. It's just talk. It's religion. 
The description he gives to each church is connected to what he is writing about, and he has to do what he sees and how he judges the church in Thyatira. So I remember I mentioned 1 Peter 4.17, that judgment begins in the house of God. And so the judgment of God in the church is not to bring condemnation, but to bring correction, to, to change, because he is the God of restoration. He wants to restore us back into a rightful relationship with him. And the Bible reminds us that before we are Christians, we did the will of the world walking in sin. So why should we indulge the very things that he died for us for? It doesn't make sense. This is why he suffered. He suffered for our sake because of our sins. So why do we think it's strange when fiery trials come into our life? It is how we are being refined. This is what the Lord uses in our lives to get us to, to be more like him. But sometimes we, we feel like it's a punishment or, you know, maybe perhaps I did something wrong that I deserve this. No, God said to expect these things in this world. You will have tribulation, right? But he also reminds us to count it all joy when faced with various trials because the testing of our faith produces patience, long-suffering, endurance. It encourages us in our walk. And so we shall welcome them Right? We should say, thank you, Lord. Give me more. <laughs> but we don't really do that, do we? We just want to get through it. And we're like, come on, I just want to finish with this. But God wants to teach us something really valuable in that about ourselves and to show us our hearts and reveal things to us that we need to change. But if we ignore those things, if we just continue to go from one trial to another, not really learning the wisdom that God wants us to see, then what are we really gaining from that trial? It's like suffering needlessly. Remember Ephesians 5, I mentioned it last week, that the Lord is preparing his bride, the church, to present her as a glorious church. And having, no, no, having any spot or wink, wrinkle, 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 and any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, we probably go, there's no way, we're all blemished, true, but not in Christ we're not. That righteousness has been imputed to us. And when the Father looks at us, he sees Christ in us. He doesn't see the sinful persons that we are. He sees his Son. And this is what he is doing. Shouldn't we then be holy, separated unto God? I'm not saying perfect. Holy means to be separated, to be set apart. And like James says in his word, keeping oneself unspotted from the world. See, we know that we live here, but we know that we're not citizens of this world. And we know that this is just a place where the Lord is allowing us to be redeemed and at the same time using us to be those vessels that bring forth the good news of his redemption. Yeah, you know, Jesus is love, no doubt. And he loves his church so much that he wants to correct them. He wants to correct us. And sometimes we refuse to listen, which is unfortunate. And when that happens, the Lord has to do something different. He has to discipline us because he loves us so much. So Jesus, as he has done with every church so far, we see here that the things that need to be corrected and removed, but there's also an encouragement first. He always begins to commend them, to praise them for the things that they do right, that they do well. And Jesus reminds him, or the church, that he is familiar with their works, just as he is familiar with our works. And he says this to each of the seven churches, I know your works. And what are the works of Thyatira? There they are. Love, service, faith, patience, endurance, and the fifth one, your second works are greater than your first works. Now, Smyrna was commended for the last, or actually, if you look at the last two churches, they weren't commended for their works. Smyrna was commended for their tribulation and poverty and commend them for their faithful suffering. And in Pergamos, he says, I know your works and where you dwell and that you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith. But it doesn't really talk about their works, not like in Ephesus where they had love and patience but here, out of all the churches so far, they have the most amount of works. And not only that, but their later works are greater than their first works. 
So here he, recomm- he actually commends them for their love, which no other church had been. We know that Ephesus left its first love. But here, Thyatira is told, is commended for its love, which means not just their love to the Lord, for the Lord, but their love for one another. This is a church that loved the Lord and loved each other. Because we know that without loving the Lord, we can't love anyone else, right? Because he is the one who gives us the ability to do those things. To, to see all the shortcomings that we have and, and understand that we are all a work in progress and the Lord is doing an amazing work in us as long as we're willing to conform to what he was trying to do. But he also says here that, that love, that agape love, that only comes from a relationship with the Lord because we know that apart from him, it's not possible for us to love this way. Our love would be one that could be easily annoyed. It could be a love where we lose patience. It could be a love where we take things personal. It could be a love that disrespects, or it could be a love that is selfish, that we think about ourselves first before thinking of others. It's a key quality that any church of the Lord should have, that agape love. Because of our fallen nature, we really are incapable of loving the way the Lord does. But it's only through that relationship with him that we're able to do that because he gives us and equips us to do those things. We fight our flesh because we know we must forgive and give mercy and compassion, even though our flesh wants to say no. But the Lord helps us by showing us what it means to love. And when we think about the love that he's given us, how could we not feel the same way about other people? How could we not be compassionate and merciful and graceful? And evident in the work that it produces, right? Because this church, their ministry or their service to God and to one another comes from the motivation of love. Remember we talked about in Ephesus that nothing can be done without love. When you look at the Lord, everything he does, his motivation behind it is love. When he corrects us, it's because he loves us. When he died on the cross for us, it's because he loved us. When he came in in, in the form of a man and suffered for our sakes, it's because he loved us. The Father sent him because he loved us. And so love is really the motivation behind it all. Because if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, although we have these gifts and all these other things, without love, we're nothing. Just a symbol, you know, a, a sound that doesn't really make any sense. In Thyatira, it was a, a, a neighborhood or a city, I should say, that there was a, a obviously agriculturally rich in the area, and there were the trade guilds. And the trade guilds is basically another word for union. It was like in today's standards, we would look at it as the union. And in order to work, you had to join the union. If you wanted to do well, if you wanted to make a good amount of money for your family, not necessarily to be rich, but just above poverty, you would be part of this guild and there were certain things that you were expected to do. And so there were people who probably could not be part of the guild or refused to be part of the guild and so there was always the needy and the poor. And this church probably helped out a lot of people that were needy and poor. And in their faith in Christ and in his word, the attire, like many of these cities with trades, they ate foods sacrificed to idols. And refusal to participate often ended in par- persecution, unfortunately, because you were a threat to their business. Like when I talked about Paul and Silas when they first came to Thyatira, there was a, 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 there was a young girl, a slave girl, whose masters owned her and used her for profit because she had this spirit of divination. And so people would come to her and they would pay to get div- divined, <laughs> if that's the word. And they were f- she was following Paul and Silas around and saying, these are them, you know, and, and Paul just got upset and at some point and he said, get out of her. And she, he just depossessed her. And now she was worthless to the masters because she lost that spirit of divination. So he really put a dent where it hurt in their pockets. And so because of that, they, put in, they had imprisoned Paul and Silas. But 
you know, here it is years later and it's still there, right? This is their business and they helped many and they, they did what they did. They got involved. The church grew. So the deeds or the works of the church were far more when this letter was written than when it first began. So this church was growing. It was active in its faith. It was serving and taking care of others and resisting the influence of the world around them. But there was something that needed to be removed or corrected. According to this letter, there was a woman whom the Lord called Jezebel. She was a self-proclaimed prophetess, but Jesus doesn't say she is a prophetess. And she may have been in a position of leadership, or she could have been in a position, obviously, of influence to the church. Jezebel was most likely not her name but just a reference to an Old Testament woman who was very evil, one of the most, I think the most evil woman in the Old Testament. And because of the likeness of what she was doing, Jesus calls her this name. Either way, when we look at this, if you ever want to know more about Jezebel, you can look in the, in the book of 1 Kings. King Ahab, which is a descendant of Jeroboam, Jeroboam was the one in whom God gave ten tribes after Solomon because, because of Solomon's sin, because of the wives that he married for political reasons, eventually laid, actually indul kind of led him astray, even with, with all the wisdom that he had. Isn't it amazing that we could be wise, but we don't even apply it to our own lives? Solomon would have known from anybody how important it was not to go to the high places, but to appease his wives, he went to these high places and participated in, and unfortunately brought idolatry into Israel. And Jeroboam was the captain of the army or the commander of the army at the time. And the Lord told him, if you listen to me and you obey me, I'm going to give you these 10 tribes and your descendants will sit on the throne. I think he said forever. I may be wrong. But it's interesting because... Jeroboam's like, wow, okay. And then, and this is a disconnect that I, I find really hard to believe when I read the scriptures. But then again, I go, you know what, Lord? I am could be guilty of this too, right? So here Jeroboam is given this amazing promise. And he thought about, okay, now when it comes time to do the sacrifices, the, the Israelites were not allowed to sacrifice outside the temple. So they all had to go back to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was just two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And they had to go back there to give the sacrifices. And he was afraid that if the people would go back to the temple, their hearts would go back to Jerusalem. So what does he do? He sets up two calves in ben, Dan and Bethel. And he says, now this is your worship. This is where you bring your sacrifices. Now, I don't know about you, but if the Lord tells you, if you do this, I will do that, you would think that that's exactly what the Lord's going to do, right? Why would you worry about the people's hearts being led back to Jerusalem. And perhaps in the long run, that would be God's desire anyway, because that's where his temple is. And, and so, but unfortunately, he did not listen to the Lord, as, which is always the root of all causes of our troubles. And, and then eventually his descendants became evil and more evil. And Ahab was the most evil of all the kings at this time, because he goes, and, because, and I'm going to read to you in 1 Kings chapter 16. It says, It came to pass, that though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the wicked ways of his fathers, that he took a wife, Jezebel, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. 1 Kings 16, 31. King Ahab, King Ahab actually took a wife from the daughter of Ethbal, the king of Sidon. And so Sidon was, a, was, was actually what we would call today modern-day Lebanon. And Sidon worshipped Baal. And now Jezebel, the wife of, a, of King Ahab, who was a weak leader, unfortunately, because he allowed his wife to really rule and reign and do things, even coerced him into saying, you know, well, if you want that vineyard that belongs to Naboth, just take it. You're the king, and he had him killed and took his vineyard. She was one of the most evil characters of the Old Testament who attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. 
But in reality, what she was doing is slowly replacing the true worship of the Lord with the worship of Baal. She had influenced all the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom into worshiping Baal, and she actually had at her table eating 800 prophets of Baal. That's a lot of prophets. Baal was a fertility god, and his worship involved immoral and promiscuous practices. There were temple prostitutes, both male and female, associated with the worship of Baal. In the same manner, verse 20, the Jezebel of this church had taught and influenced God's people to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, this is not as simple as just saying, okay, they were buying cheap meat because when they would sacrifice these meats at the temples, now they had this meat that they would sell and you could get a good deal. You get cheap meat. But, but that's not, it, there's more to it than that because there's something linked to the fact that you were eating things sacrificed to idols. Most likely it had to do with the trade guild of Thyatira. Christians had to join in order to work, made up mostly of pagans who attributed their success to the idols they worshipped. They were successful because of Ashtoreth or Baal or whoever God, whatever God they served or whatever idol they believed in. And in the guild, you were expected to become involved. You were pressured to join meetings which usually took place in temples where the worship of these idols were prominent, with the practices of drink poured out as a limitation to that God, drink offering, and also eating of meats sacrificed to idols. And so in a way, by eating that, or partaking of that, it was like you were agreeing with, I'm okay with this. For what? For the sake of survival? Now, from what I remembered through the Old Testament and even the New Testament, isn't God the one who really provides? Do we really need to compromise? Or should we just trust in the Lord? I know it's easy to say, if you have mouth to feed and a home to take care of, but at the end of the day, isn't it the Lord who does that? Isn't he the one that gives us the opportunities and the abilities to do what we do? The skills that we need to work, to produce, to provide for our families? He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider of all things. And I love that verse that says, I have never seen the elect for loss of bread. Right? He always provides. Always. I mean, you look at Christians who don't compromise and they trust in the Lord, you'll hear stories and testimonies of God's faithfulness. I believe that every time we do things in our own wisdom and our own strength, and I've said this many times, that we rob God the opportunity to prove himself mighty in our lives. That the Lord is sitting there, or maybe not sitting, but he's, well, let's say sitting. He's sitting and he's saying, Raul, okay, you got a dilemma. What are you going to do? Are you going to look to me to help you, or are you just going to do it on your own? I remember my son, and I, I've shared this before too. It was always a good illustration that the Lord showed me because um, he loved Legos. And one Christmas, almost every Christmas, we got him a Lego or something. And I got to help him with it because I loved the Legos too. So I would show him like, okay, see the drawing? Now, that piece, what piece is that? Yep, okay, so where does that piece go? Right, and then... So it got to the point where now one Christmas, I want to help. He goes, Dad, no, I got it. And I'm like, but I want to help you. And he's like, I got it. So I'm like, okay. And I'm sitting there watching him go through it. And like the Lord reminded me, you know, Raul, you're like this sometimes. I want to help you, and you don't want to take my help. I'm like, okay. Thank you, Lord. I need to know that. <laughs> and in many ways, we're all like that, right? We... We forget that the Lord wants to show himself mighty in our lives, but we steal him the opportunity to prove it because we do things in our own wisdom and we do things in our own strength. But in this guild, you were expected to become involved and you were pressured. And, and if you didn't do these things, you might be thrown out, you may not be accepted, and you may not have opportunities, business opportunities, because word would get around, don't deal with this guy because he, he thinks our God is not a God and he thinks his God is better or whatever they say to, to, to influence people around them. But again, it always goes back to the Christian. We need to think differently than the world. 
the, the, the world is all about influences and who you know and what you know. And the one thing we know is Jesus. That's the only thing we need to know. That's the best person we could know. Since this woman Jezebel proclaimed herself to be a prophet, which clearly she was not because of what? Because of her teaching. That's first telltale sign. What is the prophet saying? What is this prophet is saying? Does it go against God's word? If it does, well, then there's a problem here. She's probably not a prophetess, or he's probably not a prophet. And that's why it's so important for us, as Paul encouraged Timothy, to, or John says, test the spirit. Spirit's what? Man, woman, whoever. She may have even given a prophetic word, which is very impressive sometimes to Christians. Well, this person told me, you know, that God said I should go there. And but did God tell you to go? I remember when I was going to Nicaragua, uh, when I had lost my job at, at um, Lucent Technologies, and I had a lot of time on my hands. The, f- the market was flooded. I wasn't sure what to do next. But I started to go serve at the church instead of just staying home and doing nothing. I mean, I didn't really want to work on the house because that means money and I didn't want to spend money. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go serve. And I got to go on these missions trips and it was amazing. And I went to, 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 to Nicaragua almost twice or three times a year. And then people started coming to me and saying, God told me you're going to be a pastor over there and that you and your family are going to move. I'm like, well, when God tells me, I'll be the first one on the plane. <laughs> so, but right now he hasn't told me that. And then my wife went with me. I said, we got to go together. And And we were praying about it, and the Lord said no. He closed that door. And we were okay with just going and supporting the work that was being done there. It was awesome, and and it was for a time, right? But, you know, it's so important for us to really know the voice of the shepherd because there's so many voices in our heads. There's so many voices around us. We need to really know the voice of Jesus. We need to, and how do we do that? By just spending time with him, by getting into the word, by praying, by worshiping. These are things that we need to do. This woman probably said to some of these men or women that were struggling with the guilds, oh, it's okay, go ahead, go to the temple, go ahead, just, part. you know, that's not you, that's not, that. but just participate because you need a job, whatever. Whatever she said to them to influence them, and then eventually the very thing that she said to do became a stumbling block for them. She's a good example of how our sins can influence and entice others to sin. Now, there's two things that caught my attention when I was reading this. First of all, it's personal to Jesus when we cause others to stumble. Notice how he refers to the believers as his servants. It says they're his servants. To someone who does not understand this title of being a servant, they may be offended. But in the eyes of the Lord... It is a great title. It is a title of honor and privilege because our Lord and Savior was a servant. Remember, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many, to give his life as a ransom. And for us, maybe we don't give our lives as a ransom in the sense of dying for someone, but we do die to ourselves to serve one another, hopefully. And the Lord modeled that. And so when I look at that, I think about, wow, Lord, what a great privilege and honor it is to be called your servant. See, the world looks at everything upside down, right? Everyone should be in charge and everyone else subservient. But with the Lord, it's the other way around. He who is the greatest is the least in the kingdom. See, because the Lord, he stepped away from all he had. We can never imagine what it was like to leave heaven I can't even understand it. Was, were the angels worshiping him? Were, was, was he there by the, just in the presence of the Father? You know, all these things. And he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And so he humbles himself. He becomes the very creation that rebelled against him. And he dwells among us, not as a king, not as royalty, not in a plush mansion with servants, but in a humble, almost poverty-like home carpenter, son of a carpenter, a common trade. And you look at that and you say, wow, he came of no reputation, he suffered, he was rejected by his own, and though innocent, he was sentenced to death. 
and he willfully gave up his life for us. He did this all willingly, even as God, because his love for us and his love for the Father superseded any other desire that he had. I think, Lord, you know, isn't that how we should be? Our love for you should supersede our own desires and what we want and, and, and be that person in the church that, that loves you and loves one another and is just there to say, Lord, here I am, like Isaiah sent me. Lord, sometimes we want to be sent to a nice place, right? <laughs> a very comfortable place with not too many bugs or, you know, air conditioning. And I remember we went to Nicaragua, there was zero air conditioners back then. Later on, about a couple of years later, they started putting them in the motels. We had cold showers, no hot water. It's, you don't know what it's like to go into the shower at six in the morning with freezing water. It really wakes you up. <laughs> well, you might know. <laughs> I don't know how it is in boot camp, but I tell you, it's, uh, it's amazing. It, it's, and it's like, okay, Lord, thank you. Or to eat the same thing every day because we didn't want to eat apart from the church. So we ate in the church and it was rice and beans every day. And you get kind of tired of rice and beans every day. And it does things to your body which are not good either. So <laughs> drink lots of water. <laughs> so the other thing that I also looked at was that he, stayed, he just stepped away from all that he had. In humility, he had no problem with doing this. He didn't, sec- he didn't complain. He didn't say, Lord, but he just, yes. He took on that form of the man. He lived among his creation, and he did what he did. And it was amazing because that's the kind of servant that he was. And that's the kind of kingdom that awaits us, a kingdom where servitude is the most important thing. It also shows that we have a relationship with him because we understand and we belong to him. And it's like that, thank you, Lord, for giving me eternal life, and now I can sleep better, and and, and my life knowing. See, there's there's two ways to look at that. Some Christians will, will say, thank you, Lord, because I get to do this. I understand the importance of serving you. And others will think will look at their their gift of eternal life as a life insurance policy. And it's like, okay, so Lord, I got this, thank you. Put in my so you have these Christians that, that will, will say, okay, I get it. I understand that my life is no longer mine. I belong to you. So Lord, put me to work, put me to serve. And there's some that just say, well, I have this life insurance policy. I'm going to live my life, but when I die, I know where I'm going. And they're missing the whole point of why Jesus did this. And, and it's to serve and to be the Father's will in our lives. He, served you, he saved you for a purpose, not just to give you eternal life, but to, to serve him in some capacity, shape, or form. And, and, and it doesn't matter what your calling is. The most important thing is that you're obedient to that calling and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Where do you want me? And if he does save us, then what does that belong to you and I? Then it means that my life is no longer mine. Lord, I've heard this say that Lord is not his first name. Lord means that he is the Lord. We serve him and what he wants for us. And the second thing is that it is personal to Jesus whenever we cause any of his children to stumble. Remember that Jesus warned back then when in the book of Mark, he says it would be better for anyone to have a heavy millstone hung around their neck, and to be drowned in the depth of the sea than to cause the little children to stumble. But, you know, it's funny how sometimes you read things and you don't really, you don't really have one of those aha moments where you see something and you go, wow, I never really looked at it that way before. And I was thinking about this verse that came to mind, and then I go and I look at it, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, and it says something really unique. But whoever causes one of these little ones, and here's the part, who believe in me, not just any little ones, but the ones who believe in me, and of course I'm sure this applies to all the children because they're innocent and they're they're dependent on us as adults to take care of them and help them. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck. So when I looked at that, I was like, this applies to you and I as children of God. It does. 
You know, and if we cause any of our brothers and sisters to stumble, it's important to, to recognize that the Lord doesn't want us to do that. And I looked at another verse that says, Woe to the world because of offenses. This is actually the next verse after verse 6. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. So there's a warning there. So it's important for us to remember that, but Jezebel didn't really seem to care. So when we read the judgment of the Lord upon this prophetess and all who have joined her in corruption of the church, consider how much the Lord loves this church and each member. Because despite this ongoing sin and the weak leadership that has allowed it to continue, because we're the leaders in all this, right? Jesus will step in and correct it, and yet, one cannot help to look at the mercy of the Lord in verse 21. And I gave her time to repent, and she did not repent. So Jesus' greatest accusation was that this Jezebel did not repent. That was his judgment. She did not repent. Now, it's hard for us to look at this and go, wait a minute, this woman has caused so many problems, and, and, and why is she given a chance to repent? Because that's the mercy of God. He chooses mercy over judgment. But when mercy is denied, judgment comes. And she, like anyone else who goes so far as to sin against the Lord and influences others, are also blinded. And so maybe we could say, well, she's blinded, she's in bondage to that sin, so how can they repent? Good question. How? Well, because we know that the church has a helper. Who is the helper? The Holy Spirit. What is the... One of the things that the Holy Spirit does, convicts the world of sin. John chapter 16, verse 8. So the Holy Spirit's always at work in our lives. Even when we're blinded, it's still there because the Lord desires for us to turn and to repent. But there can become something in, in, in us that hardens our hearts to the point where we don't even listen to the conviction that we're given, which God is always faithful to do. And so if we're not hearing that voice of God, telling us to, to change, to repent, well, then the Lord's going to use something else. He's going to bring chastisement in. And hopefully through that, we will learn and we will turn and repent. And so he says, this woman, anyone else in bed with her, and this is not talking about physically, but it could, apparently rejected the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, and so now he's calling them to repent. And now sentence comes. The leaven must be removed unless it leavens the whole lump. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. Again, we see the mercy of the Lord in the judgment here. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. So Jesus not only wants to warn of the judgment, but also reminds them that it is not too late to avoid it. All you need to do is repent of your deeds. It's that simple, right? It's complicated in the sense that sin has a way of gripping us. But if we see the value of letting it go because of what we gain from it, then what we gain from that sin is never going to compare to what we gain in Christ. And so we're able to let that go. But if you don't, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each of you according to your works. When judgment comes, you know, we often question how a God of pure love can be so harsh. But in the definition of agape love, the love of God, love must have boundaries. To, to, to love, to just love general, generalizing it, is not real love. Love is truth. God's love is truth. The world's love is not. But God's love is. And I think if you look at the laws that were given to Israel from a helicopter view, one would see how these laws define the boundaries of how the Israelites were to live in a land of boundaries. And it's interesting because when Jesus was confronted by one of the scribes, or, or I think it was a scribe, he said, um, Jesus, what is the greatest of all these commands? And he says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. It's all about love. 
The law was meant to be all about love, to show us how to love one another by re recompensing people for the things that we did against them. Uh, a love where we're not capable apart from the Lord. And the second summary of the purpose of the law, which I love the most, really shows a good picture of why God wrote the law. And it's found in Galatians 3.24. Anybody know it? For the law is the tutor to Christ. So the law was meant to show us that we were in need of a savior, the greatest need that man had to know in order to believe in a savior. Because if you don't think you need a savior, you're not going to look for one. But when you realize and recognize that you do need a savior, then what are you going to do? You're going to ask, say, Lord, I believe. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need you. Again, this summary all points to love. The boundaries are given because why? Because the Lord loves you and he is patient. He is long-suffering. He desires for us to turn from our sin before judgment comes. I'm not just talking about the overall judgment at the end, whose names of people are not in the book of a Lamb of Life will not be able to enter into the kingdom, but will be cast into the lake of fire. But instead, this is the judgment that he wants us to get us back on track, to get us right with him, because he knows the dangers of sin. He knows what it can do to us. He knows what it can do to our church, to our families, to everyone around us. But getting back to verse 22, Jesus revealed the purpose for this, for this chastising. First, it was to draw them to repent of their deeds. I love that. Not to punish them, not to get angry with them and say, oh, you deserve this. Yeah, they deserved it. We all deserve it. But he wants to draw them to repent of their deeds. Again, just showing that mercy comes from ju before judgment to those who belong to him. If they don't hear these words, then maybe they will hear through the chastisement because the Lord desires that none should perish. And even if that means that you got to lose something or get hurt along the way, then it's better for that than to lose your soul. It's better for that that the Lord takes something away from you so that you will not walk away from him, that you will not have a relationship with him. I like the metaphor here that they use because she said she herself will be cast into the bed of affliction and those who shared her evil deeds will also be cast into tribulation. This could be transmitted, this would actually transmit, this should be, this could be translated that she will eventually become sick and may actually die. All who follow her may also, and don't repent, may also have death. But it also could mean spiritual death. I saw a quote this week that said, all men die, but all are not killed with death. I love that. Because there's some things that are worse than death, and that's that eternal separation from God. Spiritual death is worse than physical death. Because once we die, our seal is, our, our fate is sealed by the choices that we make. I always say this at funerals, that dash on the tombstone represents all the decisions we make from the time that we're born to the time that we die. And if Christ is not in that decision, then we already know what our faith is going to be because the Bible tells us, his word tells us. A second reason that he did this was to give an example of holiness to other churches and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and will also act accordingly to your works. Now that word minds and hearts has to do with kidneys and, and hearts, <laughs> which it was believed back then that the kidneys if, were the source of emotion and the heart was the thinking. And so it applies to the emotional and the thinking part of us. Um, and that's why, but... To me, minds and hearts sounds great. I love it. I'd rather hear that than kidneys and, and hearts. <laughs> but, but those in Thyatira who had sinned in this way not only violated the moral principles of the scriptures, the law of God, but they had sinned against their covenant relationship with the Lord. Because we as believers, we're bound to walk in obedience, inward purity as well as outward reverence. People should see from our lives, reflect in our lives, how we are Christians. And in verse 24, Jesus had some encouraging words to those who did not follow in the ways of Jezebel. She says, now to you I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Now I love that because you're here in the church and 
they're reading this letter and pretty strong words about, you know, what's going on. And I'm sure there's someone in there, because it's probably for us to, to think this way sometimes. Well, Lord, I didn't do that. I didn't follow this Jezebel. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And, and Jesus is like, I haven't forgotten you either. <laughs> you know, let me, let me just tell you what I have to say to you. Hold fast what you have till I come. Well done. Just be faithful. Continue. Because it's easy to see people that are growing and being blessed because of really giving in and compromising. And the people who are trying to be honest and do rightful living before the Lord may look at it like, well, why are they getting blessed and I'm not? You know, and it's so easy to be influenced by that. But the Lord says, look, just keep your eyes on me. Don't worry about all that stuff because none of that really matters. None of that is going to make a difference when I return. So Jim, Jesus just simply says, look, hold fast. That's what we, It's like grip onto me, hold on to me, hold on to what you've been reading and what you've been learning and what I've been teaching you and showing you in the word because you know what? As long as you do, nothing will go wrong in the sense of us. The world we know has problems. We know that there will always be problems. Problems are not an indication that we did something wrong. It's just the world we live in. It's a world fallen by sin. And there will be times that you may not be recognized for something that you think you should have been recognized for at work. There may be times that somebody else may get a promotion that you deserved. But at the end of the day, it's like, Lord, if you wanted me to have that, you would have given it to me. So I need to trust in you. Because sometimes what we think is a blessing could actually be a curse. And so we need to just trust in the Lord as we pray things through, as we walk through these things, that he knows what we need and he's going to provide for us. And sometimes we think we have something that would really make us happy and then he shows us something that's going to make us even more happy. And that's where we just got to trust in him. And so it ends with this, that chastisement is for those who do not repent and reward is for those who overcome. To him I will give power over the nations. Jesus promised that his people will reign with him. This is from Psalm 2. He shall rule with a rod of iron. And it talks about how the Messiah, when he comes, will rule over the earth. In that day, righteousness will be enforced, and those who rebel against Jesus will be dashed to pieces like a clay pot hit with an iron bar. So you and I get to be a part of ruling in this world. But that word rule means to shepherd, which is really cool, because it's not like the rule of the Gentiles. It's the rule that means that you will be executing judgment, yes, but also administering mercy and direction as well. Consulting people, giving them, you know, um, direction on how to do things differently. I will give him the morning star. So what is this, the morning star? Because in Isaiah, we know that the morning star is Lucifer, but if we go to Revelation 22, which we don't have to because eventually we will get there one day. But Revelation 22, 26 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. There's a difference between the morning star and the bright and morning star. See, he is the light that outshines all other lights. Satan is always trying to imitate Jesus. I'm going to see that in Revelation. Just like there's a trinity, there's a trinity with, with, with Satan as well. The prophet, the antichrist, and the beast. And we got the mark of Cain. See, I'm, spoiler alerts. Then you have the mark of the antichrist, the 666. So he's always trying to imitate the Lord. But we'll, we'll see that when we get there. <laughs> but for now, what can we learn from this letter? Because all of these churches are a reflection of things that we can learn from. If we allow corruption, because Thyatira is called the corrupted church, if we allow corruption to come into our lives, and sometimes it starts very subtle, and we have to be very aware. And this is why it's so important to always be in the Word, to always be in relationship with the Lord, because He will show us things that we need to see. But when He does... What are we going to do with that? Are we going to reject it or are we going to accept it because he's not trying to chastise us. He's trying to show us something that can keep us from something greater that could hurt us. 
Because it says there in the beginning, because you allow. I don't know if you caught that when we read it. He was saying to the church, because you allow. This shows the sin of the church of Thyatira. On the outside, they were a model church, showing works, love, service, faith, and patience, good works. And yet, there was significant, significant corruption inside the church. And the sin of the church was not being addressed. It was being allowed. And this is what happens in our lives. We can allow this kind of stuff to happen and fester and grow. And before you know it, we're causing other people to stumble. Um, and sometimes it's not obvious because we turn a blind eye to it because there's something about it that is beneficial to us. Sin is fun. Sin feels good, but it's not good for us. God bless you. So the draw to the guilds was powerful, but in the same sense, we have those pressures today. We're drawn, to, we're drawn to things that may benefit us, and we could hide under the guise of, this is what's best for my family. Sometimes we move to another location because we're offered more money, and then we don't even look to see. I know this from experience, not that I personally went through it, but there were people that have gone to other places, and there's no good churches around them. Like, to me, that should be the first thing you should look into because it's important to be in fellowship. But because, oh, but this will be better for my family, it's cheaper, it's the cost of living, or, or you know, um, or because, and, and people challenge me sometimes, family members say, you know, you really want to live in Jersey, it's so expensive, we got to move first. I go, I'm only going to go where the Lord wants me to go. If he wants me to stay here, he's going to provide. Simple as, as that. I go, and, and if all the Christians leave all these areas that are compromised, who's going to be the light, right? Who's going to be the one to tell them about the gospel? God puts us near the darkness so that we can expose the darkness, so that we can bring light to them. But if the light leaves, what's left? Just darkness and more darkness. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end and even here, we see that with the immoral and idolatrous influence of Jezebel, Christians can overcome and keep Jesus' work until the end. We must not become overly discouraged at immorality and idolatry around us, but we must be careful not to indulge in it. We must be careful not to idolize anything, because today we don't have temples with idols in them, but we have idols in our hearts. It could be a career. It could be a relationship. It could be the TV, it could be social media, it could be anything that takes you away from the Lord and distracts you is an idol. You know, they say that an idol could be a tool or, or an idol. So I don't know if I agree with that. I just think that it's, God's going to be faithful to show you. Like, and usually, like to me, it's like when I wake up in the morning, what's the first thing I look for? If I'm not looking for the Bible... But if I'm looking for my phone because I want to see what happened on Facebook, because I don't really go on Facebook, so if you ever send me stuff, don't take it personal. It's just I don't have that kind of time. I'm sorry. And, and I see as, unfortunately, not you guys, but I see it as superficial. Oh, I just had the latest coffee from such and such, and I just bought this and this. And I'm like, what? That's okay. But if someone posts a verse and says, oh, the Lord showed me this today, that's kind of cool. I'd be like, oh, wow, that's nice. But that stuff has a way of drawing you in. And, and it reminds me of something that the Bible talks about, that in the last days, people will be lovers of self. And you look at social media and people, and I'm not digging on social media. I'm just saying that, but it's a reflection of where people are. And so it's important for us to recognize those things and to be careful not to allow those idols to grow lest it steals our hearts away from Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, thank you again for all these incredible reminders that we need to hold on to, how important it is for us to just keep our eyes and our focus on you.